We're taking a peek into geek culture and sharing our top 10 fandom favorites. Let Your Geek Side Show presents Geek Culture Countdown. Hey there, this is Kitty. The Geek Culture Countdown is taking a short break, so why not count down the days with one of our previous podcasts? We thought you might like to listen to our list of the top 10 iconic superhero weapons. On this episode, my guest Andrew and I scoured the pop culture armory to find the most terrific tools in any crime fighter's arsenal. See if you recognize our top 10 choices from Dark Horse, DC Comics, Marvel, and more. All right. Welcome back, Andrew. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I think there's an important distinction we need to make before we launch into this list for our listeners. Um, yes, there are many different ways in which superheroes fight crime, and sometimes it's with their bodies. Um, and so we left out any things that weren't actually... Um, physically distinct from the superhero. It was part of their anatomy. So we left out Wolverine's claws. We left out the Hulk's fists. There are a lot of things that are pretty iconic in the way that the superheroes fight crime. But if it was actually part of who they are, we left it off the list. So should we just dive right in? I think we should. All right. Number 10 on our list is Judge Dredd's Lawgiver. The the Lawgiver is the official weapon used by street judges in the 2000 AD comics, um, British uh, serial. Um, most famously used, of course, by Judge Dredd to police the crime of Mega City One. The lawgiver is a type of handgun that can only be operated by its designated owner by way of scanning the palm print. And if someone who is unauthorized to use it tries to pick it up, it will explode in their hands. They do, of course, have fail safes and, and workarounds so you can authorize another user. But generally, one judge, one lawgiver. Um, the gun is capable of firing numerous types of rounds, including armor-piercing bullets, heat-seeking missiles, incendiary ammo, and rubber-coated metal bullets that uh, Judge Dredd frequently uses to bounce off of other surfaces. If he can't make a straight shot to the guy, it can bounce off other surface surfaces at devastating speeds and still pierce through someone's flesh. And the Lawgiver is considered to be the ultimate smart gun. It does come from a dystopian future, but it is very technologically advanced and has a lot of different fail-safes to prevent people from accidentally shooting other people with the lawgiver. So number 10 on our list is specifically, even though it is a, a make and model of gun, it is Judge Dredd's lawgiver. And it's really cool because of that, I, I don't know, something about the ID recognition, mm -hmm. you know, it's just fascinating to me because I've never seen that in real life. You know, I've really only seen it in that. Mm -hmm. And so it's iconic even in its own world, despite the fact that it's a make and model. It's his, and it's something that he's in tune with. Yeah, and I've actually, I've never read the 2000 AD comics. I do remember selling them at the comic book store mm -hmm. uh, that I worked at. But I almost, I want to know, and, and listeners, please do tell us if this has happened. Has, if uh, Judge Dredd has ever stopped a crime by saying, hey, here, can you hold this gun for a second to, like, the criminal? <laughs> um Maybe, the maybe not. Supreme tactic, you honestly. Know, like, like, <laughs> uh, that's that's how I would do it. You'd only get away with that once, maybe twice, and you'd also have to explain to your boss why you kept blowing up guns. But, <laughs> I mean, it's all in the name of justice, right? It's in the name of justice. <laughs> the next item on our list, the next super weapon, uh, it's, it's shooty, but not the same kind of shooty. <laughs> it's uh, number nine is Spider-Man's Web Shooters. So Peter Parker is more than just a wall-crawling, butt-kicking teenager. He is a certified genius and brilliant inventor. People often forget that Peter Parker invented his own signature web shooters all on his own. <laughs> and he's a high schooler, so it's insane. They uh, activate by just a double tap in the palm. So they, they attach on the wrist like bracelets almost, mm -hmm. and a quick double tap uh, right in the palm there, the iconic little Spider-Man hand. Bring you know? your fingers down. And yeah. We're doing it right now. Which is surprisingly hard to do. It's yeah. Kind of make, it really shows how super he is. He's got like super flexibility there. <laughs> <laughs> but different types of taps when it's not just a regular old quick double tap, he can go on and do different variations of web too. So he's got ice webbing, acid webbing, taser webbing, flame webbing, sonic disruptor webbing for those pesky symbiotes, and tons more. I mean, he's got like Z metal coiled in there. Oh uh, my goodness. He's got all sorts of webbing, and all of it just goes to show how creative that a weapon itself can be, you know, and, and how the user really... Um, can be creative too. Oh man. <laughs> creative uses to, to, to catch criminals just like flies. Um, and that one we did, we did include on this list. I mean, because it is especially the motion of using the web shooters is very iconic, but a lot of people do forget that he doesn't shoot 
organic spider silk. There are some universes where it is like mm. he's more spider than man, and that does come out of his wrist. And then there's characters like Silk, Cindy Moon, who actually do create organic webbing from their fingertips. But Spider-Man's wrist uh, web shooters are a device that he himself created. Yeah, Peter Parker made them all on his own. Good for him. All right, so number eight on our list is another uh, of the shooty variety. It is Hellboy's <laughs> Samaritan. The Good Samaritan gun is primarily known from Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy films, though it does resemble some guns that he has wielded in the comics. Um, but specifically, like this is the version from Guillermo del Toro's films. Uh, it is an oversized revolver, of course, named for the Bible story of the Good Samaritan, which Hellboy was familiar with as he was brought up Catholic. Um <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. And it is equipped <laughs> with different custom bullets because, of course, he does have to fight a lot of different types of supernatural mm -hmm. uh, foes. The bullets can penetrate just about any substance, and the gun itself is supernaturally durable, partially constructed from blessed silver, church bell metal, and wood from the true cross. Um, the bullets are also made uh, with a combination. They're, they're custom bullets that he makes. Um, the gun can hold four rounds, um, and they're made of folkloric components that are are said to defeat the supernatural foes he faces, including vampires, werewolves, and more. So there's um, silver in them, and there's garlic, and there's holy water in these bullets. Um, Hellboy does kind of find it difficult to reload with um, the right hand of doom because he's got those big chunky fingers. <laughs> uh, but he does his best. He's got those four custom rounds. Um, and then, of course, he's, he's he needs to be prepared with this holy crazy weapon uh, mm -hmm. as he fights for the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense. And this, this along with um, Big Baby, those are the two guns from the Guillermo del Toro films. Um, just super recognizable, I think, especially, especially in the like oversized comical nature of the, the Samaritan gun. Um, we also actually have one in the hallway outside the recording studio. So I was like, all right, there it is. It's iconic enough that it was uh, in our hallway before we prepared this list. So It's really cool. And I like the way that it's sort of – because there's this – what you were talking about is all those different ingredients that you need for all these different kinds mm -hmm. of bullets. And I think with that gun – this gun, even though it's a huge badass gun, it's also – it kind of reveals the the more all chemical side of Hellboy that yeah. he's got to go out and get these ingredients for it. And so when I learned about, you know, the different makeup of the bullets and everything, it brings to mind for me images of like Hellboy almost in a quieter kind of calm light, you know, where mm -hmm. he's going out and finding these ingredients. Like he's got to get the onion. So he's got to go yeah. do some a little bit of farming to get the onion. Yeah. And it's a cool concept that I don't think – has been explored too much in the monster hunter genre. I mean, you you always got to be prepared. So yes, you're yeah. gonna bring you're gonna bring wooden stakes to fight vampires and uh, whatever blade brings with him and and help Van Helsing and and of course you're gonna have silver bullets for the werewolves. Um, mm -hmm. Anecdotally, I'm reading a novel called Trail of Lightning um, by Rebecca Roanhorse, and the main character is a monster hunter, and she is uh, Native American, and so her bullets are custom made with. Um, corn pollen and obsidian, I think, which is what wow. the Native Americans of her tribe believe would dispel ghosts. And so she's like, I, I think it's really cool that supernatural idea of like, really you is. can blend technology with the mythical to create a badass rifle to take down the monsters. The ultimate, the ultimate shooting weapon. 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 <laughs> um, I got to follow up with number seven though. And number seven might be my favorite. It's not the most iconic, but it might be my favorite. And those are the lantern rings. So we got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, black and white, ultraviolet, and even phantom. All my of favorite the color. <laughs> All, yeah, my favorite color is phantom. Um, <laughs> the, these are the rings of the emotional spectrum in the DC comics. But of course, the green lantern ring is the most well known. Throughout the DC universe... The Green Lantern Ring is acknowledged as one of the most powerful weapons. Those who wield a Green Lantern Ring can do near anything with their own willpower, from creating powerful energy constructs to translating any language to flying to even healing incurable diseases most recently. Way to go, Simon Baz. Baz? Oh, Simon. yeah, Simon Baz. Ba Boz? Baz? I think it's Simon Baz. I think it's Simon Baz. Um, he's, he, he's one of my favorite Green Lanterns. Him and... Um, 
Oh no, Jessica who's his partner? Cruz? Jessica Cruz. Yeah, yes. I yeah. really like them as Green Lanterns. Oh, it's phenomenal. Their story is great, but we're not getting into that. We're talking about the weapon, the Green Lantern ring. Because it's based on the wheel po- willpower of the wielder, uh, the possibilities are endless, especially if there's a blue lantern around to give it that extra little boost of hope. I love how all the different lantern rings play into each other, you know, and, mm-hmm. and how they all are a fight not just of the the physicality, but the emotional Mm -hmm. energy that people bring to a fight. And so having the willpower to get through anything, it it really is an emotional story that you're telling there. No matter what, the Green Lanterns or any of the Lantern stories are emotional. Mm -hmm. Of course you have the, the White Lanterns, which it's a combination of the entire color spectrum and Mm -hmm. emotional spectrum, which is like, I think right now is just Kyle Rayner. I'm not even sure if he's a White Lantern right now. Um, I can't speak to that. I'm not up on all of the Lantern comics. I am not up to date. I am desperately trying to be up to date, but there's a lot of... I know Jon Stewart's an ultraviolet lantern now, Mm -hmm. which that's actually cool, like the idea of like unseeable light spectrum. Yeah, it's the invisible emotion spectrum of like the things that you don't actually acknowledge in your emotions. Mm -hmm. So again, it's always poetic. It's always beautiful. And it's iconic. Yeah. And we also just couldn't pick just one. I mean, the obvious choice is green because most people think Green Lantern Ring. But like we would be remiss not to mention the entire spectrum of the Lantern Rings because they all have their own unique logo. And and Mm -hmm. everyone has the Lantern core that you identify with the most. Do Do you have yours? Um, I usually say blue or mm-hmm. star sapphire. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so blue for everyone who doesn't know is hope. Um star sapphires they're their love, right? Mm-hmm. Um and then there's indigo, which I'm always between uh blue and indigo. Indigo is compassion. Mm-hmm. Um and they've also just got a crazy story because the indigo lantern that's a whole other yeah. let's move on to the all next the, one. All the lanterns are a little, <laughs> They have a wonderful some, story. But orange lanterns have the best oath. Um, <laughs> Go on now. <laughs> Hold on. Um what's it's what's yours is mine and or what's what's yours is mine and mine is mine and mine and mine and mine, and mine not yours. I think that's it. I think there might be a few more mines in there, yeah, but I'm pretty sure Yeah, I never sure know. It. It's an entire minefield. Um, <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. And on that note, um, speaking of the worthiness and uh, ability of the wielder, number six on our list is Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. And whosoever holds this hammer, if they be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. This mighty Uru mallet has a large gray uh, sledgehammer type head and a leather wrapped handle. It is inspired by the Norse myths of Thor's hammer. Uh, but in the Marvel Universe, it was forged by the dwarven blacksmiths on Nidavellir, and it has the God Tempest, a sentient cosmic storm also known as the Mother of Thunder, trapped inside of it. Um, the storm actually has since been freed. Minor spoilers for Jason Aaron's epic Thor run, which if you're not reading, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Um, Mjolnir has been wielded by many, and there's actually been many imitations of the hammer and recreations in different metals and um, given to different people. There was Stormcaster given to Storm, and there was Stormbreaker given to Beta Ray Bill. Um, but the original, of course, is Mjolnir. Um, its inscription has even changed before. When Jane Foster picked up the hammer, um, the inscription went from saying he be worthy to she be worthy. Um, and then they the ultimate Mjolnir from Earth 1610 uh, – in Jason Aaron's story went to say they be worthy. So it was a more gender neutral uh, hammer. Um, And apart from channeling Thor's thunderous powers, as we all know, uh, it has some really incredible abilities, um, some of which are unlocked by certain wielders and their connection to the hammer. Um, Mjolnir can detect illusions. It can change trajectory mid flight, and it can even project images that came especially in handy when um, they pulled a, uh, Clark Kent and Superman in the same room kind of situation with um, (laughs) Jane Foster, Thor, and the mighty Thor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mjolnir knew that she needed to pull a fast one on some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who had definitely found her cell phone and, like, figured out she was talking to Captain America, who was Sam Wilson at the time. (laughs) Um, And so... The hammer is is extremely powerful. It has since been broken. It was uh, shattered and um, broken apart by Mangog, but it was uh, reforged by Thor, harnessing the power of the storm. And it's just a really beautiful epic saga. And of course, we know how it goes in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It was also shattered. It is not indestructible. Pieces of it have been shipped off. That's how you get Frog Gjolnir, uh for, for. Sorry, say that again. Frog Gjolnir, uh for Simon Walterson, Thor Frog. 
Um, yes. Sorry, Simon Walterson, because I always want to say Walt Simonson. Simon Walterson. <laughs> um, you know how it goes. But yes, so there, there have been many versions of the hammer, but of course the OG Mjolnir uh, is number six on our list. And you said it can dispel illusions. It can. It can detect illusions and make its own. Wouldn't that have been useful in the MCU against Loki? A little bit. All the time. A little bit. <laughs> because that's a pretty important thing. The, the first Thor movie would have been over a lot faster. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. Okay, so number five on this list is Iron Man's armor. So Tony Stark is, along with Peter Parker, one of the most intelligent people in the Marvel Universe. His technological innovations have both doomed and saved the day more than once. Uh, One of his greatest and most important innovations is the Iron Man armor itself. Over the years, Iron Man has made modifications to his armor that allow him an unknown amount of technological advantages. Like, I literally could not count them trying to research for this. <laughs> so I didn't try. And yet we also couldn't even count the number of suits. So we're just, it's blanket term. It's, Iron Man armor. Yeah. And they don't, always, they don't always mention in the comics, like, which suit that they're on. Mm-hmm. Um, some websites project that it's, like, around 63, but it's just been way more than that. So <laughs> he's had Hulkbuster armor. Capable of taking out the Hulk, he's had nanotech armor that literally waits in his bloodstream until he activates it. Mm-hmm. And he's have he's had endosim armor based off of the biology of symbiotes like venom that don't even require electrical energy to use at all. And they respond perfectly to his mind and more. The, the, the armors go on. Um, he His armor is so technologically capable and, and so powerful as a tool that he's even been able to put his own consciousness in it which uh, that's a whole other story too but from the very first repulsor beam repulsor ray depending on what you're reading or watching from the very first time you see it it's iconic and it's thrilling and it's exciting and the first time that i saw it in the mcu I went crazy. That one even has its own iconic sound in the MCU. Like, I yeah. can't imitate it, but it's that power up, that sharp little, like, pew, pew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's that one. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Iron Man armor, either in comics or the MCU? Oh, man. Um, I recently... Am I am I good to talk about the articles I write? Sure. I recently wrote an article about uh, stealth armor that he had. Mm. And I was looking up the old... Uh, comic that that stealth armor originated in and it described the technology as using it it used micro baffling to make it so it was silent when it flew and i i thought that was hysterical and i loved that i love those sort of um old touches those those and that techno uh jargon. techno jargon techno babble whatever and so right now right now i'm on that stealth armor with the with the micro baffles, micro baffles. It's great. What about you? Do you um, have a favorite? I never remember. Uh, it's from the comics, and the comics have a horrible numbering system. I mean, there's like oh, obviously, yeah. you know, the Mark One is the big tin looking uh, suit, but but in the more modern terms, they don't number them very well. No. Um, that was kind of that was actually kind of more of an MCU thing. Like they just had nicknames in the comics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually don't remember if it's the Mark 20 or the Mark 42, but it's the black and gold armor. Oh, yeah. Um, where it's like the, it's the black exterior with the kind of golden faceplate and armor um, in the abs. Cause that, that was a, that was the suit on a couple of comic book covers right around the time I started reading Marvel comics. Oh. Um, I also just like the fact that in addition to the Hulk Buster in the comics, he has the Thor Buster. Yeah. Which is like, yeah. I'm like, dude, do you, you're like, that's almost Batman status of like, oh, I have a plan <laughs> to take down every one of my teammates. It's like, do you have a Buster armor for everybody? Because He's that's got a, little... a plan for everything. I saw uh, some armor that turns into a car. Like he'll, yep, he'll, that he'll like right. leap out of a window and then just, you know, the Autobots, like <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there was even the the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. My favorite is the suitcase armor, the Mark V oh, um, from Iron Man. So 2. cool. Yeah, but it's just like I was imagine imagine a meeting at Avengers Tower and Hawkeye's like, "Hey, where's the Hawkeye Buster armor?" And Tony Stark's like, "Do you think I really need Hawkeye Buster it's armor?" Fine. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> I Don't love Hawkeye. About. No disrespect, but like, really, man, do you think you wore Buster armor? Yeah, really. <laughs> so. Number four on our list is actually, it's been both the weapon of heroes and villains, but Tony Stark was actually the first human to utilize it, complete it. Number four on our list is the Infinity Gauntlet. Mm. Now, I'm sure everybody by now has seen Endgame and Infinity War, so I'm going to give you a little bit more background on the 
gauntlet in the comics because I'm pretty sure we all know the story in the MCU and the fact that there were two in the MCU because there was technically the fake one that showed up in Odin's mm-hmm. vault. What a bummer that must have been for them to be like, oh, we're going to put this really cool Easter egg in Thor number one. And then like Marvel's like, mm, funny story about that. We actually wanted to use that. So we're going to have to <laughs> write a way for that to be fake. Um, anyways, this golden gauntlet was designed to ho- hold these six infinity stones, which were formerly known as the infinity gems and the soul gems. They originally all were soul gems. Um, but they had their different powers and it, only until they made the distinctions and they were like, oh, only one is a soul wielding. Anyways, um, the gauntlet allows the wearer to do virtually anything once all six stones are assembled. Without the gems, it is little more than a fancy glove. But when all of them are together, the wielder can control time, space, reality, power, mind, and soul. Thanos is the most famous uh, user of the gauntlet and, and most famously utilized this to snap away all half of half of all life in the universe in uh, an attempt to impress his mistress, Death, who simply laughed at him. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Oh. Yeah, you know, when, oh. when a skeleton lady laughs at you, it's just oh. like, oh, man. Um, but whoever holds it also becomes nigh omnipotent, overshad- overshadowing the powers of characters like Eternity, the Watcher, Kronos, and the Celestials. The only known beings whose power is greater than that of a finished Infinity Gauntlet is God Emperor Doom from Secret Wars 2015 and the Living Tribunal. Um, God Emperor Doom did combat the use of the Infinity Gauntlet in Secret Wars. Um, T'Challa had it, which actually got a nice visual call out in um, Avengers Endgame when he is running the gauntlet. Mm-hmm. Uh, there there are some nice visual callbacks to the fact that he actually had it in Secret Wars, um, as well as Reed Richards was the first person to wear the gauntlet finished, but he didn't use it. Tony Stark was the first, I mean, not first person, first human. Um, but Tony Stark was the first human to actually use the stones in the comics. And however powerful the Infinity Gauntlet is, take notes, Russo brothers, in the comics, it cannot be used to destroy itself. I know that they destroyed the stones in the movie, but the stones also are like, can't destroy the stones. Yeah. Um, but the gauntlet cannot be used to snap the gauntlet away. It's almost the, can Thanos heat a burrito so hot that he himself couldn't eat it if he was holding the <laughs> Infinity Gauntlet? No. Um, Classic theory that cla- we all yeah, know. Yeah, you know, the Thanos burrito theory. The Thanos burrito. Anyway, so, and, and this one actually, I mean, it's been iconic for a while, but it only really really came back with a vengeance uh, with the Avengers slowly Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the Infinity Saga assembling all the gems. Yeah, I can affirm that I didn't know about it until it was coming up in the the movies. And you know, the the gauntlet storyline by Jim Starlin and Ron Ron Lim, that was a very popular story for a lot of people, but in modern comics, it did not get a lot of consideration. It wasn't one of those things that people kept homaging. It kind of stood by itself, and then the people who grew up with it loved it, but most modern audiences hadn't been introduced to it until... Uh, the MCU came up with this. Right. And in the comics, the cosmic cube was treated as more of a big deal, right? Yep. But then in the in the movies, the cosmic cube was? The Tesseract, which yeah. was the, it was the an space stone. stone. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of a strange crossover. Yeah. And I mean, the vision in comics doesn't have one of the gems in his forehead. And, and so they took some liberties with um, how these things appear. And also they changed all the colors from... Uh, the comics to the movies if you Mm -hmm. actually have uh, either the Unruly Industries Thanos Mad Titan figure by Joe Delgado or that massive Thanos on Throne maquette. Both of those adhere to the comic placement and coloration of the gems. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because Marvel actually did about two summers ago change the colors of the gems officially to match the movies because they don't want the the brand dissonance. They want people to know which one is which. But... uh, I want to say reality was originally purple or green. But yeah, so it's like a, a big old mix-up thing. So it's really cool, and it, it has really been shaped by the cinematic side, but it was iconic before then as well. Yeah. Well, let's move on to one that's been iconic since the beginning of the character. Uh, Wonder Woman's lasso is our number three. So Princess Diana of Themyscira is bound by her loyalty to her friends. Nothing quite bonds a person to the truth like Wonder Woman's lasso of truth, (laughs) or more recently, the golden perfect. The lasso of truth is a divine artifact held by the Amazons for countless generations. The lasso can be used offensively, defensively, and interestingly enough, even medically. It's cleared minds and bodies from mind control or toxins. But more than anything, the lasso forces everyone to face their truth and guides Wonder Woman towards the truth. The lasso can be used to connect the minds of those who hold it and create true compassion and understanding. As a weapon, it's terrifyingly powerful, and in Wonder Woman's hands, it's more than just a weapon, it's a force for good. I like those weapons that... 
yes, we've got the Tony Starks with their armory and, and we've got, um, I mean, so many of these weapons are big buster weapons, mm -hmm. but I like those things that can be used both offensively and defensively. I mean, for me, Thor's weapon is not only a, a tool to destroy, but a hammer is traditionally a tool to build with. And right. uh, we do have another weapon coming up on the list. There's only two choices left, so we're getting kind of slim. I'm sure you guys are kind of guessing what might take the top two spots, but uh, very notably another weapon that is typically an object of defense, but it can be used offensively if the wielder knows how to handle that responsibility of, of balancing the protection and the um, attack to beat back your foe. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, number two is not that weapon. Number two <laughs> <laughs> is Batman's Batarangs. It's part bat, part boomerang, and all awesome. Okay, they're not really part bat, but they look like a bat. Um, actually, they're more in line with shuriken than boomerangs, but these winged weapons are a staple of Batman's arsenal and appear in, I want to say, and you can fact check me on this, every iteration of the Caped Crusader's adventures in film and television. I've never seen them without him. The iconic weapon first appeared in Detective Comics number 31, which was just a couple after Batman's own first appearance, published in 1939, same year as the de uh, world's greatest detective made his debut. They are a ranged projectile, often used to knock guns out of criminals' hands and to pin people to walls. They're not the most lethal things in Batman's arsenal, but he does try not to kill and he does try not to use guns. And so rather than engage with foes who have firearms, he will try to safely disarm them using the batarangs. But of course, you need more than just a sharp-edged throwing tool. Sometimes uh, when Batman needs to close the distance or put distance between himself and someone else, uh, there are a, a variety of batarangs he can utilize, including explosives, magnetic, electrical, flashbang, and sawtooth batarangs, or smoke bomb batarangs for when he himself needs to get away or cause um, some shroud of chaos so that he can close the distance between him and his foe and then disarm them, incarcerate them in a non-lethal fashion. Let's not forget about the remote-controlled batarangs remote -controlled. here. Because... Well, well. <laughs> oh my goodness. If you've ever played, I, I, I played Arkham City and uh, I was obsessed with it. And you get to you get to throw that remote controlled batarang mm -hmm. and there it's just so thrilling to try <laughs> and like just aim true because, you, you know, you're going through vents and you're going around oh corners goodness, and everything. Yeah. It's like a game of operation. It really is. But then Batman's got that level of control because you're playing it. But if it was just Batman, it hit the mark every time. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. he always does. <laughs> yeah. I, that I mean, there's so many things in Batman's arsenal, but. I think the the batarangs are are just that's what does it. Definitely. But I am going to have to move us to number 1. Do it. Number 1, the most iconic weapon, Captain America's shield. So what more can be said about the most iconic weapon of all time? Captain America's shield is made out of more than just vibranium, the the practically indestructible metal material. It's made out of an ideal. Oh yeah, I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> Movie announcer voice. Whoa. <laughs> It's made out of an ideal, the ideal of truth and service for the greater good. The star in the middle is like a beacon of light that most heroes look to for their moral compass. Steve Rogers has become the moral compass for countless heroes. Captain America is Frank Castle's hero, and as tough and trigger-happy as the Punisher is, he will never fight with, the, with, with Cap, ever. In multiple comics, he, you know, Cap will almost try and provoke Punisher, or has directly told Punisher to hit him across the face. And Punisher respects him too much. He's just like, <laughs> I just, I can't fight you. And um, I mean, that, that, that's the level, the symbol, how, the, how important it is, the symbol of Captain America, the symbol of the shield. So of course, Cap's shield can be used to ricochet off walls with perfect precision. It's super durable and can hardly ever be broken unless it's some sort of impossibly powerful weapon. Mm -hmm. It's the symbol of Cap. It's the symbol of freedom. It's the symbol of good. And it is by far the most iconic superhero weapon. Yeah, and I mean, even in just, I'm gonna put on an art designer hat for here for just a second. Um, Iconicity, the the idea that the symbol is so recognizable to anyone. I mean, it's just it is a circle, the star, a couple of stripes. Like that is a supremely easy thing to draw for people, but mm -hmm. it's it's an easy thing to represent because just any contained within any circular shape, it is super recognizable. 
Um, and of course, the red, white, and blue do contribute. I mean, that that helped give it a leg up on some of these other items. I mean, the Batarang is iconic, but it does change its appearance quite frequently. Right. And while there have been different versions and shapes of Captain America's shield, at the end of the day, the idea is still the same. And we really always come back to that Rotella-style classic round shield. Um, I know I'm dropping dropping shield words on you. <laughs> um, but But that one, especially because it is more the idea than – it, it's not an offensive weapon. It can be used to protect in that manner, but it is something that he puts in front of him as he moves into battle. It's not that it's not a thing that he stands behind. I mean, physically, yes, he is behind it. And he is the hero backing that ideal, but it's the thing that follows or it, it's the thing that leads him into battle and leads him into the minds of of readers because they usually see that shield and then they see him backing up that ideal behind it. It's the balance of def- defense and offense, and mm-hmm. it's that balance to find what is truly good. Yeah. And so, I mean, these were chosen not only just for how popular and cool they are, but genuinely from the design standpoint. Like, this this is the icon. This represents that hero. And you see that, and you immediately know who you're looking at and who you're dealing with and what sort of ideals for justice that hero represents. If you enjoyed this episode of the Geek Culture Countdown, be sure to check out our back catalog of dozens of top 10 lists to cover every pop culture topic. Try saying that 10 times fast. If you have feedback or suggestions for future episodes, be sure to email us at podcasts at sideshow.com. We appreciate your continued support. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to let your geek side show. Do you enjoy the Geek Culture Countdown? We are proud to bring you pop culture content completely ad-free, but that doesn't mean we don't need your support to help keep us going please take a moment to leave us a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting platform and help spread the word about our podcast. We welcome fan feedback. Email us at podcasts at sideshow.com with your thoughts and suggestions for how we can make our shows even better. Plus, tune in for our other pop culture podcasts. See your favorite comic and film characters evolve across two generations in the bi-weekly Then and Now podcast. Hear exclusive interviews with celebrities and pop culture industry leaders as they let their geek side show in Look Who Showed Up. Then get all the latest pop culture news with our daily briefing, a two-minute breakdown of all the biggest geek headlines perfect for your Alexa or Google News briefings. We wouldn't exist without your continued support. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to let your geek side show.